Truly heartbreaking is the first thing I think of when the 2008 draft class pops into my head. Not because the entire draft was bad, far from it actually. But I can't shake the fact that the number one pick should have been in his prime way longer than he was. He deserved to be in his prime longer than he was. In college, Derrick Rose stood out from the rest of the pack. His athletic ability and finishing around the rim was unmatched along with his overall playmaking ability. It was a no-brainer for the Bulls to take him at number one, allowing him to begin his career with his hometown team. Rose began his time in the NBA with a bang as well, finishing the 2008-2009 season, winning the Rookie of the Year award, following that up with three straight All-Star appearances, and in the 2010-11 season, Rose became the youngest player in NBA history to win the MVP award. MVP wasn't all Rose was chasing, though. He also led the Bulls to the Eastern Conference Finals that season. Unfortunately, the stacked Miami Heat team overpowered them in five games. Even though they lost that series, it was clear that Rose was the future of the league and had the potential to be one of the best point guards that the game had ever seen. But all that potential began slipping through his fingertips following his MVP season. First game of the 2012 playoffs, Rose tore his ACL. The Bulls were up 12 points with about a minute left in the game, and I understand wanting to close out the game strong, I really do, but damn, it sucks knowing there was a chance it never would have happened if he was pulled from that game. He missed the entirety of the following season, and when he returned, Rose suffered a meniscus tear just 10 games later. Of course, after two knee injuries, he wasn't nearly as explosive as before, but he was doing everything he could to get back to playing well and helping his team out. Rose also tore his meniscus yet again in February of the 2015 season. He played one more season with the Bulls after that before being traded to the Knicks. After one very good year in New York, he tore his meniscus again, and then after that, he signed with the Cavaliers. Despite the Cavs having an insane amount amount of veteran talent on their roster, Rose was having a lot of problems staying healthy enough to actually get on the floor and was dealt to the Jazz near the trade deadline. Two days after that trade, he was waived from Utah and went on to sign with the Timberwolves about a month later. Having one of his most memorable moments in Minnesota, he scored 50 points in a regular season game against the Jazz. After that season, Rose bounced from the Pistons back to the Knicks and now the Grizzlies, where he can hopefully be a mentor both on and off the court to Ja Morant. Personally, I don't think you can compare anything to Prime D. Rose. He was that explosive. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen before when I was watching him growing up. I really do miss those days. Moving on to number two, though, the Heat took a player who I wouldn't go as far to say was a disappointment, but didn't quite live up to his potential either. Michael Beasley was seen as a player who had the capability to scorch even the best NBA defenses, and he was also a great rebounder coming out of college. The Heat took him in hopes of giving Dwayne Wade some help on the offensive end of the basketball. He made the all-rookie team in his first season. However, his time with the Heat would be short-lived, and he was dealt to the Timberwolves in the 2010 offseason. This move was made to provide enough cap space for the Heat to sign LeBron James and Chris Bosh. Beasley had a great first season in Minnesota where he averaged a career-high 19.2 points and 5.6 rebounds per game. But after that, things began going downhill quickly for him. In 2011, Beasley violated the league's drug policy and would make a bad habit of this throughout the rest of his career. 2013, he was released from the Suns after being arrested on suspicion of marijuana possession. About a week later, Beasley signed with the Heat, but wouldn't get too many chances because of how good the roster was. From there on, he went to the Grizzlies, to China, back to the Heat, back to China, to the Rockets, then the Bucks, Knicks, where he actually played very well, then finished his career on the Lakers before being traded to the Clippers and getting waived. After getting waived from the Clippers, Beasley once again violated the league's drug policy and was suspended before signing with the Nets as a substitute player till he tested positive for the virus and his contract was ultimately voided. Since retiring, Beasley has continued to play in China. Next up, we have another player who unfortunately got involved into the drugs. OJ Mayo was another elite scorer that this class had to offer. Scouts loved his vertical, and when you pair that with a smooth jump shot like his, he was able to score from almost anywhere on the court. The T-Wolves selected him with the third overall pick, but he was a part of the first draft day trade. Mayo had a great rookie season, coming second in the Rookie of the Year voting just behind D. Rose, but things quickly began to go downhill for him after his second season in the league due to off-court issues. After showing up late to a game day shoot around in 2010, he was removed from the starting lineup. 2011, he got in a fight with Tony Allen over a card game that he lost, and he apparently didn't want to pay his debt. And that same year, he served a 10-game suspension after being caught using PEDs. At this point, the Grizzlies had enough mayo, they decided to let him walk in free agency. He signed with the Mavericks and looked like he was getting things back on track starting in all 82 games, but after just one season, found himself on the Bucks. 
Then he just couldn't stay away from the drugs yet again, violating the league's policy for the second time and earning himself the longest suspension in NBA history. Two entire years. Never made a return to the league after that. He did, however, go on to play overseas, and I believe he is still playing to this day. All right, at number four, we have a player that stayed away from the drugs and was a dominant player in his prime, but now his name is getting dragged through the mud like I've never seen before. It's a little bit ridiculous if you ask me. You either think he is one of the greatest to ever play the game or think he's a stat patter with no rings to show for it. I haven't heard too many opinions in between. Russell Westbrook was a player that could do it all. The athleticism that he brought to the table was unbelievable, and the superstar recognized that. Him and Kevin Durant quickly emerged as one of the most talented young duos that the league had to offer. Westbrook made the all-rookie team right out of the gates. He would not lay off the gas. He made his first all-star appearance in the 2010-11 season, was an essential piece in the Thunder's trip to the finals in the 2011-12 season. Despite the Thunder losing that series in five games to that stacked Heat roster, he still gave it everything he had to get him there. Unfortunately, game number five, he shot a dreadful 4 for 20 from the field, which certainly didn't help out their chances, but he did play well in the previous four games. While the playoffs haven't treated Westbrook well since then, he certainly saw a good amount of individual success. He led the league in scoring with 28.1 points per game in the 2014-15 season, and after KD left in the 2016 offseason, Westbrook stepped up as the sole scoring option for the first time in his career. The 2016-17 season, he started his triple-double reign of terror, being the first player to average that stat since Oscar Robertson. Along with this, he led the league in points per game for the second time in his career and won the MVP award, finishing the year averaging a jaw-dropping 31.6 points, 10.7 rebounds, and 10.4 assists per game. The next two seasons, forget about it. He averaged a triple-double yet again. However, it was clear that despite filling the stat sheet, Westbrook did not have what it took to lead the Thunder to a title. As a result, of this, he was traded to the Rockets for Chris Paul, two picks, and two pick swaps. This reunited Westbrook with former Thunder teammate James Harden. With these two players both being recent MVP winners, they were supposed to be an unstoppable duo, but they wouldn't be able to bring home a title, and Westbrook was traded after just one season with the team to the Washington. Wizards. He did make the all-star team though for the final time in his career with Houston, but once he was in Washington, Westbrook averaged a triple-double for the fourth time in his career and led the league in assists per game for the third time in his career. But he was once again on the move in the offseason, forming what was supposed to be a big three with LeBron and Anthony Davis. This big three was a big flop to say the least, and near the trade deadline, Westbrook was part of a three-team deal that landed him in Utah. He had his contract bought out before playing a single game though. Since then, he signed with the Clippers. Clippers are top five this season in the Western Conference at the time of making this video, so they might be able to put up a little run in the playoffs, but I'm not sure if they're going to be able to take down the powerhouses and win it all. What do you guys think? Moving on to the fifth pick is actually one of Westbrook's college teammates who had a great career and is still playing today. Honestly, Kevin Love just always has done his job so well. Whatever role any team has needed him in, he's all in. No complaints, no whining, nothing. Now, the Grizzlies selected him with the fifth overall pick, but he was a part of a draft day trade, including OJ Mayo, that made him a member of the Timberwolves. Although he spent some time coming off the bench in his first season, Love still made the all-rookie team. His breakout season came in the 2010-11 to season, where not only did he make his first all-star game, but he also led the league in rebounds. He finished that season averaging 20.2 points and 15.2 rebounds per game. Love also had a game that season where he scored 31 points and matched it with 31 rebounds, still one of the craziest stat lines to this day. Although Love was the face of the Timberwolves by that point, there wasn't much help around him and they struggled to do much in the playoffs. It also didn't help how competitive the Western Conference was around that time. The 2014-15 season, Love was dealt to the Cavaliers, making him the final piece of the newly formed Big Three in Cleveland, him, LeBron, and Kyrie Irving. As a member of the Cavaliers, Love made some major adjustments to his game. He lost a substantial amount of weight, making him more of a floor spacer and less dominant of a force on the boards, but that was an essential change that helped the Cavaliers make four straight finals trips. While Love would struggle throughout the team's 3-1 comeback in the 2016 finals, he was still a key piece in that team-making history. After LeBron left the team in the 2018 offseason, Love was given a huge extension. However, it took him some time to come to terms with the fact that the Cavaliers were now a rebuilding team. As time went on, he embraced that role though as a mentor to the team's younger players and was an essential part of their relatively quick rebuild. In the middle of the 2022-23 season, he returned to 
to a championship contending team, signing with the Miami Heat after having his contract bought out by Cleveland. Love still remains a member of the Heat to this day and played a major role in their unbelievable eight seed playoff run to the finals last year. At number six, we have the first international player selected from this draft class. Nilo Gallinari was looked at as an elite and consistent shooter during his time playing in Italy. The Knicks took a chance on him with the sixth overall pick. However, he got off to a slow start to his career, missing a big chunk of his rookie season due to back problems. Once Gallinari returned back to normal though, his second year with the team proved to be a turning point in his career. He jumped up to averaging over 15 points per game and around five boards. And even though he played very well, he was on the move in the 2010-11 season, being traded to the Denver Nuggets as a piece in the blockbuster trade that landed Carmelo on the Knicks. Gallinari took over as the Nuggets starting small forward throughout his first two years with the team, and just as things were starting to look up for him, he suffered an ACL tear that brought his 2012-13 season to an end. This injury also caused him to miss the entirety of the next year. When he made his return to action, it didn't take him long, though, to regain his starting spot and averaging similar stats to before the injury. In the 2017 offseason, Gallinari was traded to the Clippers, where he was a great piece of that roster. He also had a hell of a season in 2018-19, averaging 19.8 points and 6.1 rebounds per game, while shooting a lights-out 43.3% from three. However, following this season, he was dealt to the Thunder in a huge deal that landed the Clippers' Paul George. After one year with the Thunder, he found himself on the Hawks. Hawks, Spurs before being waived, Celtics where he tore his ACL for the second time in his career and missed the entirety of the 2022-23 season. He did this while playing for his home country of Italy in a FIBA World Cup qualifier game. Wizards up until a little over a week ago and is now on the Pistons in hopes of somehow fixing that mess of a team. Going to the seventh pick is another sharpshooter that is still in the league today and playing very well. Ever since Eric Gordon was in college, he was elite from deep. The fact that he drew strong comparisons to Mitch Richmond before coming into the draft should have gave everybody a good idea of what to expect once he got to the NBA. Clippers grabbed him with the seventh pick. They would not be disappointed. He had a strong start to his career, earning himself a spot on the all-rookie team and continued to improve each of the next two years with the team. However, in the 2011 offseason, he was traded in a big deal to the Hornets for Chris Paul. Shortly after his Hornets debut, it was discovered that Gordon had cartilage damage in his right knee, was forced to undergo surgery. As a result of this, he was only able to play in nine games that season. While he saw a slight regression following the surgery, he still held on to his spot as a team starting shooting guard during his time in New Orleans. The 2016 offseason, Gordon signed a four-year deal with the Rockets. While he saw a reduced role in Houston, he certainly made the most of it when he was on the court. In his first season with the Rockets, Gordon took home the sixth Man of the Year award after averaging 16.2 points per game. He continued to serve as a key piece for them off the bench, but the Rockets can never put all the pieces together to win a title. In the middle of the 2022 season, Gordon found himself back on the Clippers but was waived in the offseason. He then took that opportunity to sign with the contending Phoenix Suns, where he has started in nearly half of the games that he's played in. Gordon has had a strong start to this season, and a lot of things would have to go their way, but this could be the best chance that Gordon has at a title. Moving on to number 8, unfortunately, we have our first true bust of the draft. Joe Alexander was looked at as a player who could make some real noise at the NBA level. At 6'8", 230 pounds, people were comparing him to Sean Marion. The Bucks took him in the eighth overall pick, but this would be a big mistake. He averaged a rough 4.7 points and 1.9 rebounds per game in his rookie year, mainly due to not seeing the floor. Milwaukee was quick to dish him off to the Bulls after the 2008-2009 season, and after eight games in which he barely played, shot 16.7% from the field, Alexander would never see an NBA floor again. On a positive note, at least he went on to have a successful overseas career. And moving on to the ninth pick, a point guard who had an elite three-point shot and was on over 10 teams throughout his NBA career. Now, if I go over every single team that DJ Augustine has been on in depth, it's going to get super confusing. So I'm going to keep it as simple as I can for you guys. The Bobcats drafted him with the ninth pick and he had a strong rookie season, earning him a spot on the all-rookie team and shooting 43.9% from three. His best season as a member of the Bobcats and arguably his entire career came in the 2010-11 to season where he averaged 14.4 points and 6.1 assists per game. After playing out that rookie contract, he signed with the Indiana Pacers in the 2012 
12 offseason. From that point on, Augustine spent the majority of his time coming off the bench for a ton of different teams as we just talked about. After the Pacers, he went on to play for the Raptors, Bulls, Pistons, Thunder, Nuggets, Magic, where you could say he revived his career starting in more games than previous seasons, Bucks, Rockets, and then the Lakers. Overall, DJ had a very respectable 14-year career in the NBA, averaging right around 10 points per game, being a plug-in point guard for almost any team that needed him. Rounding out the top 10, we have a player who is still one of the best defenders in the league. Brooke Lopez was taken 10th by the Nets, and he almost instantly took over as the team's starting center. He earned himself a spot on the all-rookie team after averaging 13 points, 8.1 rebounds, and 1.8 blocks per game. And as time went on, the Nets moved from New Jersey to Brooklyn. Lopez took over as the team's best player, earning himself a spot in the All-Star game in the 2012-13 season. But after nine years with the team, it became clear that the Nets were incapable of making any meaningful play off runs with Lopez. The 2017 offseason, Lopez found himself on the Lakers for just one year before joining the Bucks, and by this time, he had added a consistent three-pointer to his resume, which really helped space the floor in Milwaukee. He was a crucial part in the team's championship run in the 2020-21 season, where they would take down the Phoenix Suns in six games in the NBA Finals. While the Bucks haven't been able to make it back to the Finals just yet, they definitely have remained contenders, and with the addition of Damian Lillard in the offseason, I am really excited to see this playoff run that they could put together. I want to see the Bucks and Suns at some point in these upcoming playoffs. I think all that star power would make for a super fun series. That's all I'm saying. At pick 11, we have another player who would bounce around the league a lot. Jared Bayless, offensive weapon out of Arizona. The Pacers drafted him. However, he was traded to the Trailblazers on draft night. Throughout the first two years of his career, he struggled to find his shot. Really wouldn't be able to break into the Trailblazers starting lineup consistently. In the 2010 offseason, Bayless was dealt to the Hornets, but only played 11 games before being traded once again, this time to the Raptors. He played well with the Raptors, averaging about 10.5 points per game during his time there, and after Toronto, he ended up on the Grizzlies, Celtics, Bucks, 76ers, and finally the Timberwolves to finish off his career. Just an overall solid bench slash role player type guy in the league, lasted 11 years, so that's pretty good in my book. Unfortunately for him though, no deep playoff runs during his time in the NBA. Yay. Number 12, Jason Thompson, taken by the King, started off his career on a positive note, had a solid rookie year, and followed that up with the best season of his entire run in the NBA, where he averaged 12.5 points and 8.5 rebounds per game. However, after that second year, he saw less and less playing time from there on out. He was traded three times after his run in Sacramento came to an end, first to the 76ers, where he didn't play in a single game, then he was immediately sent to the Warriors, and then finally the Raptors to finish out his career. While it's easy to look at Thompson and say he was an over overall bust. Nine years in the league is still a good amount of time, and he also played overseas after retiring, so there have certainly been worse players. Jumping into the 13th pick, we have an NBA champion, Brandon Rush, an extremely athletic guard with the ideal frame for an NBA player and a great defender. Blazers took him at number 13, but he was traded to the Pacers on draft night. During his three-year run with the Pacers, he bounced in and out of the starting lineup, but was never able to fully take over that role. The 2011 offseason, he was dealt to the Warriors, where he would eventually win his lone NBA title during his second stint with the team, but before that, after his first run in Golden State came to an end due to an ACL tear, he found himself in Utah for one year. Turns out Rush came back to the Warriors right when the dynasty was being built, and he played a reliable bench role during the 2015 title run. 2016 offseason, Rush signed with the Timberwolves, where he played the final year of his career. Overall, Rush wasn't going to blow you away on offense on any certain night, but that's okay because defense was always his strong suit. Jumping to number 15, the Suns took Robin Lopez, Rolo. With them already having Shaquille O'Neal on their roster, it was a bit difficult for Lopez to break into the starting role in his rookie year, but he did do it in his second season once Shaq was gone. He had a solid four-year stretch with the Suns where he was a valuable bench piece or starter if they needed him to be. Once he joined the Hornets, though, Lopez saw a much bigger role. He took over as the team's starting center for all 82 games, but would only remain with the team for one year despite averaging a career high in points, blocks, and rebounds at the time. Went to the Blazers, Knicks, and then the Bulls, where I personally think he played some of his best basketball, and since then, he's went on to play for the Bucks, Wizards, Magic, Cavs, and now 2024 is back with his brother, Brooke on the Bucks again in hopes of winning his first ring. Up at 16, we have another player who joined that Warriors dynasty right at the perfect time. Maurice Spates started off his career with the Sixers, mainly in a bench role. He had a very high basketball IQ, which many teams loved, and that was good because he was on a ton of different ones. After spending three seasons with the Sixers in the 2011 offseason, Spates joined the Grizzlies and the Cavs, 
Warriors, where he played an essential bench role in their 2015 championship run. That was actually the year in which Spates averaged the most amount of points throughout his entire career at 10.4 per game, so he knew exactly when to step his game up to another level. After one more season in Golden State, he played for the Clippers and then finished his career out in Orlando on the Magic. After retiring, Spates went on to play some basketball in China. Roy Hibbert, drafted by the Raptors, but traded to the Pacers for Jermaine O'Neal on draft night. He played seven years in Indiana, made two all-star games during his time there, along with an all-defensive appearance in the 2013-14 season. Overall, Hibbert was a great defender, thrived near the rim, averaged upwards of two blocks per game, and would give you about 10 points per game to go along with it. He actually really thrived with Paul George, but after Hibbert left Indiana, things took a dive quickly. On the Lakers, he still started in every game that he played in, but his minutes started decreasing and he wasn't doing much of anything on the offensive end. Same thing could be said about when he played for the Hornets and when he finished off his career on the Nuggets. At number 18, we have one of the most clowned on players in recent NBA history, but he's had a very respectable career overall. JaVale McGee, never gonna blow you away on the offensive end, oftentimes making goofy decisions, which has led to him being on Shaq and a Fool on more than one occasion, but defense was something you could always count on. Also, Shaq and McGee clearly have had beef for a long time, which is why he's on that show so much being made fun of. Listen, Shaq, this is a three-time NBA champion you're talking about right here, so we need to put respect on this dude's name. His first two championships came on the Warriors when they had Durant, but let's not lie to ourselves and act like McGee didn't play his part on the team. He might not have had the most minutes, but he made the most of it almost every single time he was on the floor, being very efficient when given his opportunities. His third title came in the bubble with the Lakers when they took down the Heat. He started in almost every single game in the regular season leading up to the finals, but didn't see the floor during that series against the Heat. Nonetheless, he was a part of the reason they made it there in the first place, so he deserves some credit. McGee is still playing to this day as a bench piece to the Kings young and upcoming roster. Number 19, JJ Hickson, selected by the Cavaliers. With the Cavs being a contending team at the time, he didn't really have too much time to develop his game before being thrown into the Wolves. He started off his final season with the team strong, but was on the move to the Kings short after that. In the middle of the 2011 season, Hickson found himself in Portland where he played his best basketball, starting in almost every game along with averaging over 13 points per game and 10 rebounds. Once he left, things started to decline. Hickson was still good on the Nuggets in his first year. In year two, though, he took on mainly a bench role, which would continue throughout the rest of his NBA career, seeing decreased minutes every season. He finished out his NBA career on Washington or heading overseas to play on various different teams. Number 21, Ryan Anderson, taken by the Nets, came off the bench in nearly half the games that he played in with the Nets. Following that year, he found himself on the Magic, where he continued making major developments to his game and took over as the team's starting power forward eventually. In the 2011-12 season, he won the Most Improved Player Award after averaging 16.1 points and 7.7 .7 rebounds per game, which was a big jump from the prior season. Anderson then bounced from New Orleans, where he played his best basketball to the Rockets, then the Suns, Heat, and finally the Rockets again for just two games before retiring from the league after the 2019-20 season. Anderson finished his career shooting the three ball at a 38% rate, which is elite for a big man. At pick 22, we had another elite three-point shooter. Courtney Lee played on eight different teams in the league, swapping between bench piece and starter, depending on where each team needed him to be. You knew exactly what you're gonna get out of this guy. He'd make you the threes when you needed him to, give you solid minutes when his number was called. Lee played for the Magic, Nets, Rockets, Celtics, Grizzlies, Hornets, Knicks, and Mavericks during his time in the NBA. The calf injury would unfortunately end his career, and he retired after a very respectable 12 years. Number 23, Costa Kufos. Solid 11-year career in the league, spending time with five different teams and improving as mainly a rebounder throughout his time in the NBA, especially late in his career. Never much of an offensive threat, but always played good defense in the post, which helped out a lot of his teams. Number 24, Serge Ibaka. An amazing shot blocker in the NBA. Serge Ibaka was compared to Sean Kent before he came into the league. Fittingly, Supersonics picked him at number 24. He missed what would be his rookie season due to playing in Spain and joined the NBA in the 2009 to 2010 season. While it took him a couple years to break into the starting power forward role for the Thunder, once he was given the opportunity, he did more than enough to prove that he belonged. 
He led the league in blocks per game in both the 2011 and 2012 seasons with 3.7 and 3 blocks per game respectively. Along with this, he was a crucial piece of the Thunder's 2012 run to the NBA Finals. Ibaka continued to be a very talented player at the power forward position for the Thunder throughout his entire time with the team. However, he was eventually traded to the Magic. He only played one year with the Magic before being traded to the Raptors, where he would play four years of great basketball, continuing to put up similar stats that he did in OKC. He was also a key piece in the team's 2019 title for the Golden State Warriors. Following his title run in Toronto, Ibaka went on to play for the Clippers, Bucks, and is now playing overseas. He made the all-defensive team three times throughout his NBA career, meeting some of the league's best scorers at the rim. On to number 25, Nicholas Batum, just an overall well-rounded player. Started off his career with the Blazers for seven seasons, where he put up over 11 points per game and over five rebounds. Then he found himself in Charlotte on the Hornets once again, just doing his job well, averaging similar stats to when he was on the Blazers and even helping the Hornets make the playoffs in his first season with the team. After his time in Charlotte came to an end, he wound up on the Clippers and is now currently playing playing for the Sixers, hoping to cash in on a late title run. Don't get me wrong, the Sixers are a good team. When they get down the stretch of the playoffs, Embiid and Maxi are going to have to carry that team. I feel like they just need one more piece and they might be able to actually take down some of the powerhouses in the East, like the Bucks or the Celtics. They do have Mo Bamba though. I got home. 26th, George Hill played for many different teams throughout his 15 years in the league. Started off his career in San Antonio, but after three years was on the move to Indiana. Backed up Darren Collison for his first season with the Pacers, but after that took over the starting role, and I personally think he played his best basketball there. They made a lot of deep playoff runs with him on the team, but never put all the pieces together to take home a championship. After the Pacers, it was the Jazz where he played great yet again, Kings, Cavaliers, where he made it to the NBA Finals and started in every game of that series, but ultimately they lost in four games to the Warriors. Actually, a very memorable moment from that series is when George Hill missed a free throw to win the game, potentially win the game, that is, and J.R. Smith grabbed the rebound, tie game, proceeded to dribble out the clock to send the game to overtime when they easily could have got a shot up to win it. It made no sense at all. Classic J.R. Smith moment, but anyways, then Hill was off to the Bucks, Thunder, 76ers, Bucks again and finished off his career back in Indiana with the Pacers for the 2022-23 season. I kind of feel bad for Hill because he barely missed out on a ring on more than one occasion, but I guess that's just how it goes sometimes. Skipping to the 34th pick now, Mario Chalmers. Taken by the Timberwolves but traded to the Heat before playing in a single game. Chalmers was the starting point guard during the Big 3 era with LeBron, Wade, and Bosh on the team, so he picked up two rings along with them. He was always a good defender on the team and shot the three ball well when they needed him to. One moment from Chalmers' time on the Heat that I remember most is when him and LeBron got into a little bit of a scuffle after there was a miscommunication on defense, which was pretty funny. After his run with Miami was over, he found himself on the Grizzlies, but unfortunately tore his Achilles following the 2015 season, which caused him to miss the following year. He returned from that injury, but only played one more season before retiring in the 2018 offseason. Since then, Chalmers has played some overseas basketball. Number 35, DeAndre Jordan, super high-flying, athletic big man, an elite shot blocker on the defensive end. Some people compared him to a Dwight Howard before he entered the draft. Superman over here. The Clippers scooped him up, and he immediately found a spot in the rotation in his rookie season, but wouldn't take over as the full-time starting center until the 2011-12 season. This was also the year in which the Clippers acquired Chris Paul, so Jordan and Paul were an elite pick-and-roll duo at the time time and two-thirds of the Lob City combination, one of the most entertaining big threes of all time, Chris Paul, Blake Griffin, and DeAndre Jordan. During his prime, Jordan led the league in field goal percentage for five years straight, starting in the 2012-13 to season, shooting 64.3%, 67.6%, 71%, 70.7%, 80.3%, 70.3% and 71.4% respectively. Along with this, he led the league in rebounds two years in a row during that stretch as well, with 13.6 and 15 rebounds per game in the 2013 and 14 seasons. Jordan also made his lone all-star game in the 2016 to 17 season to top all that off. No true playoff success for Jordan until he got to Denver though in 2022 when he won his first NBA title. 
Now he's still playing for the Nuggets, currently hoping to add another to his resume. Jumping to number 37 here, another quality option, Luke Bamute. 12 years in the league, played for many different teams, and was a high energy type of player. Bucks ended up drafting him, and he spent the majority of his time with them as their starting power forward. Bamute was never much of an offensive threat, but his defense was good enough to give him minutes and made him stand out from the rest of the pack. After his time with the Bucks was up, he moved to the Kings, Timberwolves, Sixers, Clippers, Rockets, Clippers again, then finished his career with the Rockets yet again. Towards the tail end of his career, injuries started to catch up with him, but Bamute always gave it all he had on the court. Pick 43, Patrick Ewing Jr. One year... 0.4 points per game. Safe to say, Patrick Ewing's son, unfortunately, did not pan out in the league. At pick 45, though, we had a draft day steal. Goran Dragic was a great story. Everybody counted him out early, so it provided him even more reason to succeed later on in his career. One article said that his name should be Tragic instead of Dragic because of how bad he was playing. Safe to say, for the rest of his career, that article's author would shut their mouth. After starting off on the Suns, Goran moved to the Rockets where he would start his assignment. Once his contract there expired, he returned to the Suns where he started off his career, this time being the starting point guard along with winning the Most Improved Player Award in the 2013-14 season. Along with his lone All-NBA team appearance, after averaging 20.3 points and 5.9 assists per game, the 2014-15 season he was dealt to the Heat in a three-team deal. He made the first and only All-Star appearance during his time with the Heat in the 2017-18 season and was a major contributor to the Heat's final run in the 2019 to 20 season. Unfortunately, in game one, Dragic went down with a left foot injury and it would be a crushing blow for the team and their chances of winning that series. Goran then spent some time with the Raptors, Nets, Bulls, and Bucks before recently announcing his retirement from the league. The best for last, pick number 56, Sasha Khan, 25 total games, 0.9 points per game, and a one-time NBA champion with the Cavaliers. What more can you really ask for from an NBA career? Now, I think it'd be pretty hard for someone to top 0.9 points per game, but you should still take a look at this video right here. About 70-plus point scores in NBA history, they might have a chance to beat Sasha Khan as the GOAT. You never know.